It's those scholars which have traveled upon their methodology throughout the centuries, even though they might not be specifically from the first three generations of Muslims. That is the second uh, level or the second point in our, our reference point uh, for understanding the book and the Sunnah. The third point is the Arabic language, the pure Arabic language, not the Arabic language which was invented or became corrupted uh, after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the language, the Arabic language during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But however, here's an important point, that we do not allow mere linguistical plausibilities. Just because something is linguistically plausible, we do not allow that to reject a belief which is either unequivocal in the Quran and the Sunnah or something which was understood by the righteous uh, generations. And I'd like to give you one quick example upon that. Some scholars of deviant sects take the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where Allah says, Ar-Rahmanu ala arsh istawa, that the merciful upon his throne is stowa. And they try, I'll explain, they try to explain this word as stowa, as stiwa, to mean conquered. They say that he, Allah has conquered his throne. Now, in the Arabic language, this is a, a, a mistake in the first place. Because in the language spoken in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu this word istiwa could not have the meaning of conquered. But the point is, let us just say for the sake of argument that it did have this meaning. That it's a linguistical plausibility. That there's a possibility that it has this meaning. We will not take what is clear, unequivocal in the Quran and Sunnah, in more than 6,000 proofs from the book of, or more than 1,000 proofs from the book of Allah, and the book of Allah has 6,000 verses. There's more than 1,000 proofs in the book of Allah showing that Allah is above His throne, that He's above His creation. And the understanding, the consensus of the generations, early generations of Muslims, that Allah is above His creation and He knows everything which occurs on the earth. We will not allow this mere linguistical plausibility, if it really was affirmed, and it's not affirmed, to reject uh, the first two reference points for understanding the text of the book and the sunnah. The fourth principle is that the Prophet ﷺ has explained all the fundamentals of the religion. And this is in itself, Ibn Taymiyyah has written a whole essay explaining this point, which is about 50 or 60 pages. In fact, he says that this principle itself is the fundamental principle of all principles. And that understanding this principle is the key to understanding everything else in this religion, whether it's a matter of belief or a matter of action. That the Prophet ﷺ has explained all the religion. And therefore, it is impermissible for us to come, or anybody to say, that we can innovate something, all right, innovate a belief, and attribute it to the religion because the religion doesn't have that in there. For somebody to take what he innovates, and then claim that this innovation is actually entailed by revelation. You see what I'm saying? For instance, if somebody says, well, he innovates a principle, he innovates a belief, he innovates an action, and then tries to claim that this innovation is actually rooted in the religion of Allah, this is impossible. It is an impossibility. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ has explained all the fundamentals of religion. We shouldn't think of the Prophet ﷺ as a mere postman. He just came with the revelation, dropped it off, and left the people to explain it as they wish. But as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the Prophet sallam in more than one verse in the Quran, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ He teaches them the book and the wisdom. As Imam al-Shafi'i said, and as you'll find in that book al-Risala, al-Hikmah is the sunnah of the Prophet sallam. So the Prophet sallam taught the book and the sunnah, or the wisdom. And therefore it is impossible for us to conceive that anything of the religion was not explained so clear by the Prophet ﷺ. And that is why the, uh, the, the Salaf understood this so well. Look at the statement of Abu Dhar. Contemplate it for a few moments. Abu Dhar says there is not a single bird flapping its wings in the skies except the Prophet ﷺ has given us some knowledge concerning that. What he meant by this, that there's not a, a single matter. It's just he was giving an example, a similitude, right? That if there was something, knowledge about it, except the Prophet ﷺ has given us knowledge of that. And one time a Jew came to, the Prophet, to uh, Salman al-Farisi and said to him, Is it true that your Prophet ﷺ taught you the manners of defecation? He said, Yes. He has told us that when we uh, defecate, we should 
clean ourselves with three stones. That's what they used to use in that time. And that we should not use our left hands. And we should not face the Qibla. Or we should not use our right hands, excuse me. And we should not face the Qibla. And the Prophet ﷺ said in a clear hadith, there is not a single thing which leads you to paradise except that I have told you and explained to you. And there's not a single thing which leads you to hellfire except that I have warned you from. And Allah in the Quran says, اليومو أكملت لكم دينكم. This day I have completed your religion for you. Look how the Jews felt concerning this verse. One time a Jewish rabbi came to Umar رضي الله عنه when Umar was Khalif and you'll find this in Sahih al-Bukhari. And he said, by Allah, had this verse been revealed upon us, we would have made that day a day of Eid. And Umar said, I know the day it was revealed. And I know the month it was revealed. And I know where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was, where, where he was when this verse was revealed. And it was revealed on a Friday, on Arafah, and while the Prophet ﷺ was Mecca. And as we know, Friday is an Eid for the Muslims in the first place. So see how the Jews, people who reject this message out of arrogance, felt concerning this verse. The day I have completed, they said we would take this day as a Eid, a day of celebration. Yet, Muslims are unable to deal with this reality. Everybody wants to add his two cents to the religion. Everybody wants to bring out his own version of Islam. Everybody wants to put his own understanding and his own perception and his own feelings and whatever and whatever to the religion of Islam. But the Prophet's companions didn't understand. And that's why you find mankind basically, in terms of dealing with the beliefs, those people who claim to be the followers of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, three groups. Three groups concerning this issue. And now we're just dealing with the issue of just beliefs. The first group are those groups which are the philosophers of this ummah. Like a person called Al-Farabi. So a person who lived many years ago, centuries ago, was a philosopher. They believe that in actuality that the Prophet ﷺ was ignorant concerning the actual realities which he preached to. In other words, concerning Allah's attributes and concerning the Day of Judgment and concerning Paradise and Hell, the Prophet ﷺ did not know what he was talking about. And that the only way to know, and this is of course disbelief, this is kufr. It expels a person outside of Islam, even if he claims he's a Muslim. That the only way to know this is through the way of through Greek philosophy through the teachings of Aristotle and so forth, and Plato and others, other disbelievers. Now, so for this reason why they used to consider themselves more enlightened than the prophets. That's the first group, and this is clearly disbelief. The second group is another group of philosophers like Ibn Sina. And they held well, they said, well, no, it's not that the prophets were liar or ignorant. The prophets came and they lied. But they didn't lie to do evil, they lied to do good. And then what they say is that, well, look, you have to understand that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu came amongst a bunch of Bedouins, a bunch of uncultivated Arabs who knew nothing of the fine refinements of civilization and so forth. So he had to make up stuff for them. He had to tell them, well, there's, you have a creator which is on his throne who's looking and seeing what you're doing, that there is a paradise if you do good, that there is a hellfire if you do evil, in order to sort of encourage them and convince them to good, do good deeds and to become refined. This is the second group. The third group, and this is very important because this belief is widespread, this third group. And this is like, the second group is like Yusuf Ali in his translation. If you look at his translation, he says basically in general that whatever, in the footnotes he has, that whatever the Prophet ﷺ explained, uh, whatever Allah revealed in the Quran from paradise and the hellfire and so forth, these are all symbols and figurative things, meaning that they don't actually really exist. So either it's one of two things. Either the Prophet ﷺ was ignorant, like, like Al-Farabi said, or the Prophet ﷺ came and lied on, for our benefits. And this is all kufr. The third one, the third um, group, is those people who say, no, it's not that the prophets, you know, lied or were ignorant, but they came with a truth which you cannot understand unless you do one of two things. And they have two schools of thought here. One school of thought says you need to engage in reasoning and philosophical speculation. 
And the second group says you must become a Sufi and increase into mystical experiences. And only when you reach a certain level, then you'll truly understand what the Book of Allah and what the Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, say. And this is like Imam al-Ghazali, who wrote this very clearly in a number of his books, عليه, which is a complete error. And unfortunately, this belief is passively, and I don't say consciously un- uh, experienced by Muslims, but passively many Muslims hold this, that they can't accept Al-Quran and the Sunnah directly, but they must engage in either some sort of reasoning or some sort of mystical experience in order for them to uh, reach uh, the realities of these uh, beliefs.